Hey all, welcome to the Whiteboard Doctor. Uh, for those who are here for the first time, welcome. For those who have been to our channel a couple times or seen a couple videos or even subscribed, uh, welcome back. Uh, this is a free open access medical education YouTube channel where we learn from you and you all hopefully take something away from us. Um, today we're going to do a uh, kind of uh, whiteboard lecture on supraventricular tachycardias. This is going to expand beyond our five-minute EKG segments where we just talk about EKG findings, and we're actually going to go into the general category of supraventricular tachycardias, different types, management, and etc. Um, so welcome, hope you enjoy. Please leave any comments below, and we'll do our best to get back to you, whether that be questions, concerns, reflections, etc. All right, so supraventricular tachycardias, what are they? So supraventricular tachycardias encompass a broad category of tachy dysrhythmias. Uh, they arise from above the bundle of hiss. So in medicine, it's sometimes nice when uh, the definition of something actually aligns with the name of it. So in this case, supraventricular, right? So supra means above, and obviously ventricular is the ventricles. So supraventricular, suffice to say, is arising above the ventricle. So I'm going to change my color here to yellow. Um, and here's our heart, right? So we have two atria, two ventricles. Um, so the conduction system of the heart obviously has our SA node. Hopefully you all can see that. Maybe I'd be better off changing this to like an orange. Yeah, that's a little better. So we have our SA node. Then we have our AV node, right? And then we have our bundle of Hiss, which goes into the right and left bundle branches, all the fascicles, etc., etc. So, supraventricular essentially means it's arising above the bundle of Hiss. So it's going to be northward of this right here, which is the bundle of Hiss. Uh, so why is that relevant? What does that mean? So above the bundle of his supraventricular essentially means you're going to have a narrow QRS. So something that is uh, required for the diagnosis of supraventricular tachycardia is a narrow QRS. What does that mean? Um, so I can link to uh, one of our videos on intervals on 12 lead EKG. I'll put it up in the top right corner. But a narrow QRS is a QRS less than 120 milliseconds. Now there's a caveat to this, right? So if a person has a bundle branch block at baseline, um, they could be in a supraventricular tachycardia without a narrow QRS because they already have that bundle branch block. And I can link to uh, uh, bundle branch blocks on EKGs as well in the top right corner here. Um, but if someone does not have a bundle branch block baseline, then a supraventricular tachycardia arising above the level of the bundle of Hiss is going to have a narrow QRS. Um, it's narrow because these dysrhythmias arise from the atria or the AV node and thus the depolarization through the ventricles, right? So the AV node or the atria, the depolarization through the ventricles is gonna be normal. And the QRS represents that depolarization through the ventricles and thus the QRS is gonna be narrow and you know, quote unquote, normal. When you're diagnosing supraventricular tachycardias, the other thing to think of, again, it's nice when a name makes sense, is tachycardia. So you have a narrow QRS less than 120 milliseconds if they don't have a baseline bundle branch block. And then the other part of the diagnosis is tachycardia. Excellent. So as you can see from, well, what is tachycardia? I can put a link to a, seg, a video on rates, but uh, greater than 100 beats per minute, and we'll say that is ventricular rate. And if you have questions on ventricular versus atrial rate, check out that video linked up above. Um, but this is 100 beats per minute ventricular rate. Good. So diagnosing supraventricular tachycardia is quite easy and quite broad. The difficult part is then differentiating the different types of supraventricular tachycardias. So when differentiating the different types, uh, you can do it in two different ways. You can essentially classify them based on site of origin or irregularity or both. So for our sake, we'll do both. So uh, the different types of supraventricular tachycardia, um, the first we're going to say is regular rate arising from the atria. All right, the second is going to be irregular rate arising from the atria. 
And the third is going to be regular arising from the AV node. This is AVN for AV node. I know it's a little blurred there. Okay, so then what are the different types? So regular rate arising from the atria. If we think about what could cause a regular rate atrial tachycardia, it could be something as simple as sinus tachycardia, which is, you know, caused by a multitude of different things. Um, it could also be atrial tachycardia. What's the difference between these two? So sinus tachycardia arises from the SA node, right? Whereas atrial tachycardia arises from the atria. In addition to that, you can actually have a regular rhythm atrial tachycardia that is a flutter. Now atrial flutter can be regular, can be irregular as well, or irregularly regular, um, but if you have the appropriate kind of ratio of atria to ventricular beats, you can get atrial flutter, which is a regular atrial tachycardia. And then the last one is going to be sinus node reentrant tachycardia. So what is that? So sinus node reentrant tachycardia is going to essentially be a uh, tachycardia from a aberrant reentry cycle around the SA node. And I'm going to do a video, I think here today even, on AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, and I can link that up in the top right corner. Um, sinus node reentrant tachycardia is very similar to that. Um, it's just occurring around the sinus node rather than the AV node. So that encompasses our supraventricular tachycardias that are regular rhythm arising from the atria. So what about irregular rhythm arising from the atria? Uh, the most obvious one here is atrial fibrillation, AFib. Uh, I will link a video to AFib up in the top right corner here if you want to check out uh, the diagnosis of that on 12 lead EKG. Um, you can also get irregular from the atria, which is a flutter. Now I know, it could, uh, I know I mentioned that it could be a regular rhythm from the atria that could be a flutter, but it can also be irregular, just depending on um, kind of the ratio of atria to ventricular beats and that type of thing. Um, the other thing it can be if it's irregular from the atria is multifocal atrial tachycardia, where you have more than three different morphologies of P waves, right, because P waves represent the atrial depolarization, and then you get the resulting tachycardia. I don't have any videos just yet on multifocal atrial tachycardia, but there will be one hopefully in the nearest future. Okay, now regular rhythm arising from the AV node. I'm just going to above this right. AV node, so we can see it a little better. Let's cross that out. Okay, so this is going to be our AV reentrant tachycardias, AV nodal reentrant tachycardias and junctional, accelerated junctional tachycardias. So we'll just write junctional tachycardias. Uh, right after this video, I'm going to do a video on AV nodal reentrant tachycardias. Again, I'll link it up in the top right corner. So please check that out because a large portion of uh, supraventricular tachycardias, at least when we talk about them, um, are AV nodal reentrant tachycardias. Uh, when you think about SVT, that's like traditionally, typically, uh, the pattern that you are thinking of. So please check that video out, and it will be helpful um, just while understanding SVTs, because obviously SVTs encompass this humongous category of both regular rhythm, atrial origin tachycardias, irregular rhythm, atrial origin tachycardias, and then a regular rhythm, AV nodal tachycardias. Okay, um, it can sometimes be difficult to differentiate these subtypes. There's kind of subtle EKG findings, and sometimes you really can't even differentiate them unless you slow the rhythm down uh, to see if your P waves are there, if it's regular, irregular, et cetera, et cetera. All right, good. So the last thing I wanted to talk about in relation to supraventricular tachycardias was the general management. I will put that up here. Management. So, this is going to be slightly different depending on what the exact, um, what the exact uh, rhythm is and what the exact cause of the atrial tachycardia is. So, I'm going to talk about kind of just in general and then I'll just vocalize a little kind of be carefuls uh, when you're doing this general management uh, to make sure that you're not doing the wrong thing based on what the rhythm actually is. So. We divide management up into, is the patient stable or unstable? 
So if you have an unstable patient, they're hypotensive, um, they're having ischemic chest pain, they're in respiratory distress, you're going to do synchronized cardioversion. So we'll do sync cardiovert. And you can start here with 50 joules. Okay, what is synchronized cardioversion? So let's go to our 12 lead EKG here. And you can see we have our QRSs, right, which are, it's a little zoomed out, but they're less than 120 milliseconds, so they're narrow, complex QRSs. And then our rate, if we look, is definitely greater than 100. Um, I'll just tell you the ventricular rate is about 170 beats per minute. Okay, so we've diagnosed supraventricular tachycardia. We don't know exactly what kind it is. Um, again, I'll do a video on AV nodal reentry and tachycardias, but for our sake, let's just say we're not sure it's just supraventricular tachycardia. Let's say this patient is hypotensive, 70s over 40s for their blood pressure, and you're going to do synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized cardioversion essentially means that you sync up. You'll see on the monitor dots above every R wave, and that means that when you do the cardioversion, the electrical impulse is going to be given right on this R wave. The reason this is important is because if it's not synced up to give the electrical depolarization on the R wave and you accidentally give it on a T wave, you can get something called R on T, which essentially means that you try to force a depolarization, right, which would be represented by the R wave, while the ventricles are repolarizing, and this can actually leave lead to V-fib, and you can cause this patient to go into V-fib arrest. So that's why you do synchronized cardioversion rather than defibrillation, where defibrillation, although you have higher joules as well, but defibrillation is also just an electrical impulse without any regard to when it is given. Whereas cardioversion means you sync that electrical impulse to the R wave so that you don't get this R on T phenomena and send the patient into V-fib. So unstable, synchronized cardioversion. Um, the question though is, what about stable patients? So this is a patient who has supraventricular tachycardia, but they're doing okay overall, hemodynamically and symptomatically. So the first thing you can try to do is vagal maneuver. What does that mean? So you have this patient who is uh, in a supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, the heart is innervated by the vagus nerve, right? And that vagus nerve gives acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is parasympathetic and causes depression of the rate of the heart. So by stimulating the vagal nerve, you're going to stimulate that parasympathetic circuit and thus hopefully slow down the heart. You can do this by all vagal maneuvers, uh, often blow and syringe. I'm just going to write blow syringe is one that we do. Okay, you're doing the vagal maneuver, it didn't work. Next thing, adenosine. You can do es escalating doses, 6 and then 12. What does adenosine do? It blocks the AV node in general, so that impulses can't go through the AV node. The hope then is that after the AV node is blocked, and no impulse is going through the AV node, then the patient will go back into sinus rhythm because you have uh, kind of reset the depolarization circuitry of the heart by blocking the AV node. Uh, just a warning, adenosine is very uncomfortable for patients. They can get chest pain. They feel like a donkey's kicking their chest, flushed, uh, short of breath, all that kind of stuff. So uh, just be aware that that is a normal reaction for the patient. Um, and then also, usually the above things work, but you can use beta blockers and calcium channel blockers as well, calcium channel blockers. Uh, obviously, these things also slow down conduction through the AV node. Uh, they don't block it completely like adenosine, but they'll slow it down and hopefully send the patient back into a regular rhythm. Uh, these are contraindicated if the patient has Wolf-Parkinson-White, which is that uh, uh, genetic abnormality where you get the slurring, the delta wave, uh, etc. And I'll do a video some point on that, but I don't have one out yet. So you'll have to Google search that one if you have any more questions because I'm not going to dive into it there. Uh, but this is management for supraventricular tachycardias. Um, another thing to note is that if you don't know what's causing a supraventricular tachycardia, uh, by slowing them down using some of these different medications, you can sometimes get a better idea. Uh, the last note is that if this patient was in atrial fibrillation and they were stable and you converted them back to normal sinus rhythm, you risk stroke, right? Because um, in atrial fibrillation, with those atrial fibrillating, you can sometimes get a clot in the atrial appendage. Uh, that clot hangs out there, and then also you convert them into sinus rhythm, 
and that clot will then get shot up into the brain. So that is a contraindication to uh, either chemical or electrical cardioversion if the patient is stable and has been in AFib for more than 48 hours. All right, um, but for AV nodal reentry tachycardia and um, sinus nodal reentry tachycardia and all those, um, conversion back to sinus rhythm is the right thing to do. And anybody unstable, independent of their uh, actual rhythm, unless it's sinus tach, because sinus tach won't be responsive to cardioversion, but anyone unstable otherwise um, should be synchronized cardioverted uh, back to a stable rhythm, even if it's AFib with RVR and it's been going on for more than 48 hours because the risk um, is you know, uh, risk benefit, right? The risk of having a stroke is there, but if this patient is unstable from the rhythm, uh, the risk of them dying from that rhythm is also there. All right, so that's supraventricular tachycardia. I appreciate you all watching. Please subscribe if you want to see more videos. We're trying to get more videos out, and please ask any questions or comments um, in the comments below, and we'll do our best to respond. Uh, thanks again. Hope you all have a great day.